China's rise is changing the world. Stay with me as I search for the truth about China that matters to us all. Mike Pompeo, former Secretary of State of the United States and former Director of the CIA, served in the U.S. Army and is the number one sanctioned U.S. official by the Chinese Communist Party. We sat down to discuss the trajectory of the U.S.-China relations that might reshape the world order. You are very strong in pushing for seeking the truth of the origin of the virus. What's your theory? Uh, the cover-up is complete. It is thorough. It is deep. The single biggest threat to the way of life for the American people is the Chinese Communist Party. Period. Full stop. The republic is almost certain to fall only when Americans lose their virtue. What is the role of a good political order in the journey of us to fulfill, a, uh, fulfill the human self? Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining Zumi in China today. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me on the program. I'm looking forward very much to our conversation. I think the sad truth about the Chinese Communist Party is that they effectively control 1.4 billion Chinese people and they have a strong economy. And I think to them, if you have those two things, you can basically do whatever in the world and the world cannot do much about it because you have you hold 1.4 billion people hostages. And what's even worse is that you hold those people hostages probably not totally against their will. So how do America and the free world deal with a situation like that? This is not new in the annals of civilizational history. We have seen nations who had the capacity to control the information that their people receive, to dominate them. It's even more exaggerated today because the surveillance state is so deeply buried inside of China. The ability for Xi Jinping and the leaders of the MSS and the People's Liberation Army to, to all know what individual transactions look like. The digital currency is another step in the same surveillance state direction. So it's an enormous amount of power, but we've seen this before. We saw it in the Soviet Union. We saw it in Eastern Europe. We've seen this where people People at some point understand that they're being denied the capacity to raise their family the way they want to, to live their lives the way they want to, to worship in the way they want to, and they're just not going to take it anymore. What can others do? What can others externally do? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we should do the things that we have done all along when we found nation states that were trying to export that model around the world. We've said no. We said, we're not going to accept it. We're not going to let you have favored status at the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. We're not going to let you continue to take science out of the World Health Organization. We're not going to allow you to trade in the United States on terms that are deeply disconnected. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know this, Simone. An American business that wants to invest in China has a one set of rules. And a Chinese business that wants to invest in America gets to benefit from all the greatness of our nation here. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. And for the first time, the administration, President Trump and my team, for the first time, we pushed back against what the Chinese Communist Party had been taking advantage of here in the United States. It's unfair. Millions of American jobs destroyed. Billions of dollars in American wealth transferred to China. It's unacceptable. I'm confident that the rest of the world can now see this. And we're starting to see nations all across the world push back against this very real threat. We slept on it for a long time here in the United States as well. For decades, we thought selling more trinkets would bring the Chinese Communist Party into alignment with a Western vision of basic human rights and the rule of law. That failed. It didn't happen. And I think the United States now understands that. I think the American people now understand that. We're going to get this right. I think the Trump administration and the State Department have achieved a lot in this regard. but. I'm concerned with the people in China because they're so heavily influenced and controlled by the party. I think if you let the Chinese Communist Party to choose what they fear the most, is it 1.4 billion Chinese people to go against them or the rest of the world, I think they will choose the former. So how does the American leadership deal with this problem? But I think you have it right. But when a government is more scared of its own people than anything else, that tells you all you need to know about the real authority that that government has. When they are afraid, when the truth destroys the regime, 
you know this is a weak leadership. I, you, you're spot on. Um, I could talk about the South China Sea or I could talk about what the Chinese were doing in Africa and there'd be a little squawk from Global Times or the CCC. When I talked about the Chinese Communist Party having only fewer than a couple hundred million people out of 1.4 billion people and I made a clear distinction between the Chinese leadership that wants an authoritarian top-down surveillance state and people who want to live their lives you could see you could see how fragile the Chinese leadership was this is a country that is desperately trying to hold on to power a leadership that is desperately trying to hold on to power and will use every tool in their kit bag to maintain it what, what your question was what can the rest of the world do the rest of the world needs to shine a light on this we need to be unequivocally clear about the things that the Chinese Communist Party is doing to people all across the world. There's going to be an Olympics scheduled in just a few months inside of China. The Genocide Olympics will be held inside of China if the International Olympic Committee doesn't get its head on straight and say, well, no, we're not going to have athletes from across the world travel to make Xi Jinping proud. That's fundamentally unacceptable. I hope that the International Olympic Committee will see the error in their way. You know, in the United States, we moved an all-star game in about 12 hours, baseball all-star game. The world can move an Olympics in the time that it takes. We can do this. I want those athletes to have the chance to, to demonstrate their skill set and all that they have given their whole lives to to become excellent in their sport, not only American athletes, but athletes from across the world, mm -hmm. to force them to go to China to a place where if they said what was on their mind, imagine an athlete that goes there and says, I think that conducting forced sterilizations on Uyghur women is bad. Simone, what would happen to that athlete? They'd be a permanent resident in China. They wouldn't get to go home to their family. This is deeply concerning, and the world needs to use the tools that it has. China needs recognition from outside. It can't hold power if the world will come to demand that China simply behave like a normal nation. Those are the things we can do for every citizen of the world, including the people in China. Talking about the whole of a government approach, I think uh, the challenge for the U.S. government is uh, you have a, such a short-term policy <laughs> period mm -hmm. compared to, ch to China. So how do you deal with China, deal with the CCP challenge using a whole of a government long-term uh, strategy? Yeah, your point's right. So it is a challenge, but it's also an enormous opportunity. It means when America gets it wrong, we can course correct. So our elections and our election cycle, I get how the world says, well, we may have a new policy in a couple years or in four years. I'm convinced that the challenge that the Chinese Communist Party poses to the world will be broadly bipartisan here inside the United States. Mm -hmm. I think Democrats understand that. I'll give you a good example. When we passed the Uyghur legislation, imposing real sanctions on the Chinese leadership for what they're doing to the Uyghurs in the West, it got near unanimous support. Almost every Democrat and I think every Republican voted for that. This is not uh, this is not a policy that's going to flip going back and forth. Different administrations will take different views on how to prosecute this. But Secretary Blinken made clear he too believes genocide is taking place as an ongoing in the West. The leadership in this administration has made clear that they understand the threat to the American economy. I hope that they will build on what we did in the Trump administration. It will. It will provide a lasting benefit to the people of the United States if we get this right. Mm -hmm. I think that you, I agree with you. The two party has reached a initial consensus on the Chinese Communist Party, and that's probably the only unifying factor mm -hmm. for the two parties right now. Uh, do you think eventually the two party will reach a true consensus? Because I, I think there's still a little bit of difference because, like the Democrats, they emphasize human rights. I mean, you emphasize human mm -hmm. rights as well, but the Republicans, uh, they put more emphasis on economic uh, fairness and free trade and s stuff like that. Do you think the two sides will converge eventually? My sense is that this challenge from the Chinese Communist Party requires every element of American power to be used, uh, diplomatic and economic. You talked about the work that we do uh, to protect religious freedom inside of China and protect human rights. I actually think there's a pretty broad consensus already today. Clearly, different individuals, not even just parties, different individuals will have different judgments about the priorities and how we should push back. But I don't see there being any opposition to America confronting the Chinese Communist Party simply to demand 
that they behave like a normal nation. You have experience dealing with the Chinese leaders and the Chinese diplomats. China and U.S. had a meeting in Alaska this year, and Yang Jiechi lectured the American team for 20 minutes on Xinjiang and, and Taiwan. With your experience dealing with them, if you were sitting across the table from Yang Jiechi, if he does that, what would you do? Well, it's always hard to know what one would do in the moment, but it didn't happen to me. <laughs> Uh, I don't think Yang Zhixie would have approached the Trump administration in the same way. Mm -hmm. I think it was I think it was part that they were at the very beginning of the administration. I think the Chinese Communist Party wanted to send a message mm -hmm. to the Biden administration. I don't think this was about Secretary Blinken in particular, mm -hmm. or Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, who was there. I think this was I think this was the Chinese Communist Party sending a message. It was a corollary to the message they sent to us on January 21st when they sanctioned me. Right, when they sanctioned senior American leaders, that message wasn't about denying me the ability to travel to China. The message was, leaders in America, if you do what's right for your country, if you do the things that matter to American democracy, if you push back against the Chinese Communist Party, there will be personal costs imposed on you. This was a threat. And I think what you saw happen in China that day, or in Anchorage that day, was a threat. This is how Xi Jinping operates. You've seen this. He operates this way not only uh, as to the United States, but to countries all across the world. When the Taiwanese are selling dried pineapple, when the Australians are selling wine, when African countries simply want to live their lives and build out power plants, they threaten, they coerce. They use their tools of power in ways that increase political capacity for the Chinese Communist Party to dominate these countries. That's their mission set. It's deeply inconsistent with how democracies in the world operate. These are the things that the United States needs to respond to. And when someone like Yang Zhixie goes on a tirade like that, it is the responsibility of American leaders to push back against it mm -hmm. and make the claim, the claim that we know, that America is a force for good in the world and that we're going to stand with people all across the world who are simply demanding their most fundamental human rights. Right. And that's why the, the way they behave is the reason why people in the world don't trust them. Sure, they lie, they're bullies. They demand that they get to have the debates on their terms. I, I, we, we've all seen this. Just watch their Twitter accounts, right, where they make a claim that says that the Wuhan virus came from the United States of America. When they deliver PPE across the world, that doesn't work. They now have a vaccine that they're attempting to ship all across the world. I'll leave to professionals to determine how effective that is. If I were a citizen of the world, I'd want a, I'd want a vaccine that came from the West. Mm -hmm. That would be something that if I wanted to protect myself and my family, I would prefer a Western vaccine. Mm -hmm. I hope, I hope, I pray that every vaccine that is delivered across the world delivers a good health, health, out, health outcome for whoever takes that vaccine. I truly do, whether it's the Russian vaccine mm -hmm. or the Chinese vaccine, it's important. We need to get the globe vaccinated but it is very difficult to trust a regime who continues to deny, deny the world the ability to understand how the heck this virus killed millions of people across the world. And the Chinese Communist Party says, nope, we're not going to let you know who patient zero is. We're not going to let you know how this got out of our country. We're not going to let your scientists in to help us make sure that something like this never happens again from one of our poorly run, unsafe bio laboratories. The Chinese Communist Party continues to threaten the world by their incapacity to understand the risk of what they're actually doing in these biolabs. And so your point is well taken. When the world sees the Chinese Communist Party show up, they don't trust them, they don't believe that they're telling them the truth, and they are loath to work with them except in the conditions which they're required to. You are very strong in pushing for seeking the truth of the origin of the virus. What's your theory right now? Uh, I mean, assessment yeah. of that search. So we don't know the answer. Uh, the cover-up is complete. It is thorough. It is deep. They disappeared journalists. They disappeared doctors. But this is how authoritarian regimes mm -hmm. operate. We saw this. Right? Think about Chernobyl. Right? Think, think about what happened there. Uh, this is the same kind of cover-up. Authoritarian regimes reflexively deny the world access when they get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Every piece of evidence that we have seen to date suggest this came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, that it was likely a leak from that laboratory and that they were unable to control the work that they were performing. The gain-of-function research, research that they were likely performing in that laboratory uh, somehow escaped from that lab. That, I, I can't prove it to you. I can't lay out the facts for you today, but I can certainly give you an enormous 
amount of evidence, a circumstantial case that suggests that that is the most likely place where this virus originated. Media reports indicate that the uh, American government has indirectly funded the gain-of-function research in the Wuhan Virology Institute. Do you think that project will be defunded by the American government altogether in the future? Goodness gracious, I hope so. But you're not sure? Well, we certainly shouldn't take American taxpayer money to, to support Chinese activity that is being performed in a way that is unsafe. We, we, we have an obligation to get it right when we do work here in our laboratories in the United States, just like every other country does. The Chinese Communist Party has demonstrated, not just with the Wuhan virus, but multiple times, that their biosafety expertise is not up to global standards. I wish, I wish Dr. Tedros and the WHO cared about this as much as the American people must. We certainly shouldn't be underwriting unsafe laboratories. When you and President Trump reordered the China policy, what were the resistance uh, you met and why? President Trump began by recognizing that the trade that was taking place was fundamentally unfair. That's, that's how the policy set began, although you can see in our national security strategy that we released in the fall of the president's first year in office took us about uh, seven months. You can see the footprints of how we proceeded on China in that strategy document. The first place you saw policy was on trade. Well, what was the resistance? When you in, impose tariffs, it's, there's, there are always uh, certain costs that come alongside that. It impacted farmers here in the United States of America. We were able to ameliorate most of that cost, but make no mistake, there are those with deep vested interest in doing commercial business with the Chinese Communist Party. I don't have any problem with someone doing business there. So long as the rules of that trade, so long as the conduct that is being engaged in is reciprocal and fair, this is unproblematic. In February 2019, Under Secretary of State Keith Kroc, a Silicon Valley veteran, invited Secretary Pompeo on a four-day trip to Silicon Valley to meet with the country's top tech industry leaders. I know you went to San Francisco with Keith Kroc uh, to meet 36 uh, Silicon Valley uh, yes. CEOs last year. What was the goal of that meeting and what did you learn from them? We spent an awful lot of time listening to technology leaders, to leaders in the finance sector, to help us understand how they experienced their relations with the Chinese Communist Party, what they saw inside of that country. They were doing big business with them. They had high-end technology. They were both buying and selling their often distributing their products there as well, just as our uh, entertainment industry does out of Hollywood. We wanted to understand what they were seeing and facing. So we went there to listen. We also went there to educate, and we spent an awful lot of time doing that. We, we know that they don't have access to the same level of information that the United States government has. We wanted to take that information that we could, that was unclassified, and just explain to them give them the bigger picture understanding. If you're a startup company in Silicon Valley and you found a Chinese entrepreneur doing business with you, that all looks good. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that they understood that it w could well be the case that that person had every intention of ripping you off, mm -hmm. of stealing your stuff, and that you needed to be careful about that. They all know, but we wanted to give them examples. We wanted to give them cases that we knew about where things had gone badly so that they could make good decisions based on real information, not in, a, not in a tunnel without access to information that we possess. So they were great conversations. We had similar conversations with financial leaders in New York and in Los Angeles, making them aware of the Chinese Communist Party threat as well and how it could impact the lives of them and their families. How do you compare Silicon Valley with Wall Street in terms of their attitudes towards the CCP? You can't paint with that broad a brush uh, to like two locations. There are people on Wall Street who understand the challenge and are prepared to support uh, freedom-loving people across the world. There are those who just are there and want to make a buck. I'd say the same in Silicon Valley and in Austin and all the places where we have great technology here in the United States. All the Trump administration ever asked was to make sure that we could secure our intellectual property, that we could trade on a fair and reciprocal basis. If someone is investing in the United States, we need to know who they are. We need to make sure they are not connected to United Front operation here in the United States. You, you saw, Simone, mm -hmm. we had failed at that. And ultimately, we had to close down the Chinese consulate in Houston, where there was a sophisticated den of spies operating. They were stealing intellectual property from American energy companies. They were conducting activities at our research institutions that are inconsistent with their diplomatic requirements. Mm -hmm. And we shut it down. 
These are the kind of things that the United States must do if we're going to confront the challenge that Xi Jinping presents to us. Out of the 36 CEOs that you met with in Silicon Valley, how I mean, what percentage of them are just for money? They all love America, right? They all know how much they have benefited from operating in a place where there's the rule of law and property rights and a legal system that gives them recourse,、mm-hmm. and an educational system that provides them with the most innovative talent and engineers. They, they get it. They want to make sure they preserve it. They, I, I take them all to be deeply patriotic to work and trying to work alongside. They, they, they have interests. They have shareholders. They have boards of directors. They have real responsibilities. We we need to work alongside them, not in an adversarial way, to work alongside them, to help them understand and to help them work within the confines that make sense.、Mm-hmm. I think、uh, a big proportion of the American population has concerns with、uh, Silicon Valley people and Wall Street people, but you are still confident that they can turn around. They are mostly people of the left inside of our democratic institutions, right? These big tech companies are mostly populated in the states that we have that are heavily liberal. That means that they have a view of things that is different. The policies that they propose are radically different from the ones that someone like me, a conservative Republican, would provide for. We have to deliver on American national security. This can't become a partisan issue, and that's one of the things we went to share with them: that there is real risk, real risk to their business. I can tell you about stories of some of America's biggest companies, where their product is on every laptop inside of China, and their revenue is near zero. Stolen intellectual property sitting in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party, being used in an adversarial way against the United States of America, that is reckless. These companies need to understand this risk, and I think when they do, they'll begin to conform their behavior in a way that makes sense for their business and for the country. Israel and Palestinian. Last week, the Israeli and Palestinian. Conflict exploded. That's not the only thing. Recently, China, Iran, and North Korea all had problems, aggressive movements. Are these all just coincidences, or they happened all together at this moment for a reason? Well, it's hard to know. It's hard to try and link these things up. But it's clear that the world respected what we did in the Trump administration. They understood we were serious. We understood we would listen to their concerns. They understood that if they crossed a line that we laid out for them, that we would respond exactly as we had told them they would.、I、give you Iran. We made clear to the Iranian regime that there were lines they couldn't cross, and when they crossed one of them, we took down their most senior military leader, Qasem Soleimani.、Mm-hmm. We just this was this was a serious deterrence model that said to the Iranians, "This far and no further." We put pressure on the Iranians. We denied them massive amount of resources to conduct terror campaigns. This administration came in and flipped the switch, went a different direction. Immediately went and sat down in Vienna and said, "We want to go back into this old, tired, failed nuclear deal. This is going to allow your regime to have access to literally billions of dollars." And what do you see? You see Iranian-backed Hamas terrorists launching missiles into Israel today. Look. Tyrants and authoritarians respect power, reasonably used, and they understand governments who tell the truth and are prepared to deliver on the things that they say. I'm proud that that's what we did in the Trump administration. It was a very restrained foreign policy. We didn't send thousands and thousands of our soldiers all around the world. It wasn't our model. Our, our model was one that said, "Speak clearly, speak in a restrained way, lead coalitions, whether that's the Quad or the Abraham Accords." Or all the, the to build NATO, right? We improved these coalitions and their capacity to deter aggression. When you undermine that, when you walk away from that, and the world doesn't see you as serious or determined, you get responses from these authoritarians that will test and test and test and take and take a mile when one gives them an inch. How do you balance? I mean, in the past administrations, U.S. spent a lot of energy on Middle East and leaving very little energy for China. And now China becomes ever more powerful. Now the Middle East is descending into chaos. How do you balance the threat of China and Middle East today? Well, so, well that's it's a good question. You start with America first.、Okay. In in the end, we were always very clear that wherever we were working, wherever the president sent me, whether that was to Europe to build out NATO, whether it was to Asia to talk about how the Quad and countries around the region could work together. We were preserving the things that matter to Americans: our security, our freedom, and our prosperity. When we get that right, the world is safer. The world is a better place. I'm convinced of this. As for allocation of resources, the single biggest threat 
to the way of life for the American people is the Chinese Communist Party. Period. Full stop. That's just the reality of what we will all experience over the next 5, 10, and 25 years. We can still deliver coalition support in the Middle East while we're confronting the Chinese Communist Party. They are not exclusive. Last thought. They're not disconnected. The Chinese know this too. The Chinese Communist Party is incredibly active working to build uh, rail lines that extend from Western China into Pakistan so they can have access to uh, the Gulf of Oman and the Indian Ocean. And they have built out a military facility in Djibouti that is in a strategically important location. The Chinese Communist Party is very active in the Middle East as well. And the United States must do the things to help our allies and friends there be successful at preserving their security interests and thereby preserving America's security as well. The great Roman poet Virgil said that whatever was good in the Roman Empire lies in three words, labor, pietas, and fathom. By labor, Virgil meant the dignity of labor, agricultural occupations in particular, for the person and the state. By pietas, Virgil meant humility before the gods, a love of one's country, and a sense of duty that are particular to the Roman citizens. By fathom, Virgil meant Rome's destiny and duty, imposed by transcendent powers, to bring peace to the world, to maintain the cause of order and justice and freedom, and to withstand barbarism. When these three things dissipate, Rome is in ruins. America's funding also reflected the spirit of these principles and more. When America's funding principles are upheld, the country is the shining city upon a hill. If they disappear, will America's ruin also be inevitable? The CCP problem is not an isolated problem. It has a lot to do with how America views the world and how America defines good and bad. I want to get your perspective on the state of the American Republic today. As Lincoln said, America would not die, would only die by suicide. I think to a lot of American people, we can see the road to ruins very clearly, but how do we go back to the founding principles? Um, what is the most essential thing that can set us on the right path? Yes, uh, President Lincoln had it right. Uh, even our founders, a couple of generations before that, understood that the republic is almost certain to fall only when Americans lose their virtue. Uh, the capacity to govern themselves in the way that the Constitution sets out. It is only is a nation that can only be governed by a virtuous people. So we have to be very focused on that indeed. Simone, if you go back and look, I've been asked how many times, what's the biggest threat? Far and away the biggest threat to the United States of America comes from within, <laughs> comes from our capacity to govern ourselves. What does that mean? It means our founders understood that we are a Judeo-Christian nation and we had a set of understandings that built out from that. That is at PTA meetings or city council meetings or county commission meetings. These small places where Americans stand up for the things they care about, their family, their capacity to worship in the way that they want, uh, the right to pick and choose amongst the jobs that they choose to take, uh, employers that treat their people right and well. These are the things that are the engines of American democracy, and we have to get it right. When we, when we start to see what the Chinese call American decline, Right? The Chinese Communist Party wants you and me both to believe that, that China is on the rise and America is in decline. Mm -hmm. That's false. I don't buy that storyline for a minute. It is propaganda coming from the very top of the CCP establishment. But it's only false because the American people are prepared to stand up and say, we're not going to take it. We're not going to let critical race theory come into our schools and scream and say everybody's a racist because they want simple, basic fairness for every citizen of our country. We're not going to take it when they say we're going to want to eliminate your Second Amendment rights. All, all the fundamental foundings, these things that America depends on to propagate its goodness in the world, th these are the things the world is watching to see if we get right. I'm convinced we will, and I'm going to work really hard to make sure that we don't lose our way. We, we can't. To your point and to Abraham Lincoln's point, the Chinese Communist Party presents a challenge. Uh, American decline would be the end of our nation. We can't let that happen. You know, I was reading uh, St. Augustine, and he said, uh, um, our salvation cannot be achieved through a political order. And in a sense, I think all of us uh, pilgrims, we're travelers, are trying to accomplish some kind of a transcendence in our life. So um, to you, what does a good political order do to us? What is the role 
of a good political order in the journey of us to fulfill a uh, fulfill the human soul. You know, everybody gets to define their own success in the way, way that they would desire. That's what's so special about this nation. Mm -hmm. you know, the contrast between a citizen who lives in Western America, in rural parts, a place like Kansas that I'm from, can choose a life in agriculture, can choose a life in the aerospace industry, mm -hmm. can choose to marry whomever they choose, gets their worship in the way that they want to. Contrast that with a citizen who grows up in a rural part of China, who if they manage to escape destitute poverty, will live in a place where the Chinese Communist Party dictates every element of their being, how many children they can have, whether they're permitted to worship, and if so, how, almost certainly not. These are fundamental differences about humankind. As a Christian and as an American, I believe that every human being is built out, created in the image of God, and that these rights, these transcendent rights that St. Augustine would have spoken about in what you read, accrue to each individual. The United States recognizes that, and that, that's what keeps our country special. There are, there are other places in the world that recognize this too, but there's no place like the United States that has taken this to heart in such a serious way, and upon which the very foundations of our democracy depend. How many of you leaders still believe America would once again become the shining city upon the hill? I think most of us. I think most all of us. I'm counting on it. And I'm counting on those of us who believe that to continue to work, to convince every American that that's the case. I am long on America. I think the American success story will continue. I believe that you and I could be wheeled into these chairs 50 years from now, uh, and that we will still have a republic that is an exceptional nation that is leading around the world and doing things to make sure that Americans can have great lives here at home. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining Zoomi in China today. Thank you very much for your time and your thoughtful questions. Oh, thank you so much, sir.